There's her life, and here's the woman, Yvonne Ridley joins us. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So you're here in Canada. Uh, the Canadian Islamic Congress brought you here, uh, a series of lectures. What do you talk about? Um, I've been talking about Islamophobia, women in Islam, uh, feminism, Islamic issues, mm -hmm. uh, the wars. For people who don't know your story, when they, when they first hear the story, they go, what? Yeah. What, what happened? <laughs> Captured by the Taliban, all of a sudden makes a promise to them on her way out that she'd read the Quran, and next thing you know, a convert. That's right. That's it in a nutshell. But uh, basically, I was trying to think of a way to get out of this situation. Absolutely terrifying. And I promised them, you know, if you let me go, I will read the Quran. I would have promised to have learned Swahili backwards if they would just let me go. Think of how different your life would have been if that was your promise, though. <laughs> Yeah, so I started um, reading the Quran. It was an academic exercise more than anything else because as a journalist covering the Middle East and Asia, it was shocking that I knew so little about a faith which was clearly, you know, a way of life for these people. Mm -hmm. And that academic exercise gradually turned into a spiritual journey and, you know, nearly two, three years later I converted to Islam. Your first husband was Islamic? The, the father of my daughter, he was a Sunni Muslim. Yeah. And uh, he would try and talk to me about Islam. And I would just say, talk to the hand, I'm not interested. <laughs> Thankfully, he was very tolerant. And um, we're still very good friends. Um, obviously, we've got you know, our daughter in common. And I called him and I said, why did you never tell me about this great faith? And he said, you would never listen. And he is now quite amused and bemused that um, I've embraced Islam. Was it a, you read it and there was an awakening. Were you looking for this or something like this in your life before? Because you've heard of people who, mm -hmm. who look at your situation and say, you just had Stockholm Syndrome and this is, uh -huh. this is just an after. George, I was so happy with my life. I worked hard. I drank hard. I played, I went clubbing. That was perfect. What, what's the need the, here? The last thing that, uh, that I was looking for was a religion which would uh, turn my life upside down. I was really happy as a, as a party girl. Mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't looking uh, for anything. And, uh, but things started to resonate and I started to look into it more, especially with regards to the rights of women and was completely floored by what I was reading. I know people have said, you know, oh, classic case of Stockholm Syndrome, but I've actually looked into that because I've been asked to present a program about Stockholm Syndrome, and you have to bond with your captors. Which now, I was only there 10 days, and during those 10 days, I was the prisoner from hell. You I spit on them, right? Yes, yeah, spat at them, swore at them, threw things at them, in fact, every prejudice that the Taliban ever held about Western women was probably reinforced and, and, and made worse. You're like an episode of Absolutely Fabulous, sitting inside. Was that what it was? It was. It, it was a bit like Patsy, you know, <laughs> Patsy meets uh, <laughs> um, Muller Omar. It just, it was a total clash of civilization. I heard you wrote, uh, you kept a diary on the inside of a toothpaste box. Is that accurate? Yes, what did you write in there? Um, just little bullet points because I, I really thought I was going to die and I don't know you, I just wanted to leave something behind in case somebody would ever come across it. Yeah, I'm not a psychologist, I don't know, but I'm, I'm just, that's, thinking you're going to die to that point, that's the kind of traumatic experience that could really kickstart a change in one's life. When you left that situation, did you sit there and say, I thought I was going to die, my life isn't good enough, I'm not doing what I should be doing, and that helped precipitate? No, I just thought I'm going to party more when I get out, you know, and, and well, enjoy Well, you failed life. at that, Yvonne. I, I must admit, yes, um, you did. My, some of my friends are, are very sad that um, I'm no longer there drinking the champagne glasses. Well, look on the bright side, you picked an amazing time in the world to be a Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like this is this is the, this is the moment when this conversation it hasn't it's been centuries since the conversation has been this heated between the mm -hmm. east and the west. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and you know this is something that I often say. My timing could have been a bit better. 
big conversation in England had to do with the, uh, with, with the dress of Muslim women uh, in France, all over Europe. It's even a debate here. I couldn't believe, you know, I, I thought that the, the niqab issue was done away with. You know, when will white middle class men learn to stay out of women's wardrobes? How do you mean? Well, I... C the debate here is over polling and voting, right? No, it isn't that, George. Think about this. The, the issue focuses on an area where there are 67,000 voters, mm -hmm. where 5,000 of those voters are Muslims, where 12 of those Muslims wear the niqab or the face veil. Right. All of those women are prepared to go into a booth and lift their veil up to a female official mm -hmm. to verify who they are. And, you know, what is the problem? Why is this becoming an issue? And I get my hackles raised as a feminist, and I have been a, a member of the feminist movement since the 70s. As a feminist, I get really annoyed when I see that um, women's votes are being threatened. I know when you said that you're a feminist, I, I know that there are people, and they're going to be emailing us right now, mm -hmm. saying how can you be a, a feminist and, and a Muslim woman, just like how can you be a feminist and a fundamentalist Christian. Mm -hmm. It's the same point. Um, I find it liberating sitting here having a discussion with you, not being judged on the length of my skirt or the mm -hmm. size of my breasts. Right. And um, to me, I've got that liberation through Islam. I'm not saying that, you know, the, the Muslim world is, is perfect by any means, you know, there are. But this issue of 12 women, why has it become headline news in Canada? What it's is the, that's all. What is the real agenda? And, you know, we had, uh, we had this debate about the niqab in Britain, where we had the now Prime Minister Gordon Brown and uh, Dr. John Reid, two Scotsmen, talking about the niqab. And I'm thinking, hang on, these guys come from a country where the men wear pleated skirts. Mm -hmm. Then we had the Bishop of Rochester jumping in, a man with a pointy hat and a purple dress. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, what's going on here? Well, for them, it's the, I mean, in terms of full faith, it's... There's, there's so much fear and concern of security that they think this is the only way. Oh, because women who wear uh, the niqab are uh, up to no good. They hold oh, no, a bank. I think the argument is they don't know. A... The argument is that the, I'm, not, I'm not defending. I'm saying this uh -huh. is the other side of the coin, which is people say if, if you are, what do you do in a country where people are scared now? And do they have any right to be scared? I get scared when I see drunken men in the street. So do we ban alcohol? Of course we don't. I get scared sometimes... But you be drunk in the street in some places. I get scared sometimes when uh, I see some people with tattoos on their face. Mm -hmm. Not many, but there are some who have these tattoos on their face or all the face piercings. Uh, piercings. But, you know, we, we've, we shouldn't be judgmental. And, uh, you know, if you're scared of a mask... You know, what about Batman? What about Spider-Man? Oh, come on, come on now. You know, you, you know, know, you know, know no, 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 no. You're missing your point. What about your fireman, like, your lots surgeon, of people are your afraid of the dentist. Lots of people are afraid of the dentist, <laughs> with that, and it's not the mask, it's the drill. But mm -hmm. the, the argument that, 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 that the side would make is that there is not a current war happening with face-tattooed people who are in the name of Paul Booth, a great tattoo artist, engaged in a battle. That's not the same thing as what this discussion is, though, right? Well, I, I don't know of any war that's involving women who wear niqabs. It's an interesting conversation for you to have every day, isn't it? As I say, I was really sad that, uh, to, to see headlines that I thought were consigned to the, the bin uh, last year being resurrected in Canada. And, you know, Canada is a country with a tremendous reputation for tolerance, for... Um, cultural integration and it was just really sad to see that here. Are they terrorists to you, the Taliban? You know, I hate the word terrorism. As a journalist, I would love just to pick up the word terror. It's, it's yeah. meaningless. Well, it decides an emotional value which mm -hmm. takes the journalism Nelson Mandela it. was called a terrorist. Right. He is now the most revered statesman alive today. Um, there are so-called Irish terrorists in government now right. sitting down uh, working on a day-to-day -day basis in the British Parliament. You know, the word is absolutely meaningless. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Yvonne Ridley. The hour will be right back.